you can clean up your language anytime you want. And, uh, and it's <laughs> very echoey to me right now. Is there any way I can cut back on the feedback? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know why you're getting echo. Um, I... Andrew, you have uh, two windows open right now of the class. Do I? So you're he hearing everything twice. Yeah, he just got rid of one. There we go. Yeah, that did it. All right. There you Good. go. Well, we, we kicked it off, so I sound really intelligent to everybody watching me. Um, good. Wait, are we are we live? We're, are we live right now as well? We're or, locked or, up, but you know what? I'm just going to shove that part down the memory hole. No one will ever know that happened in the recording. No one will remember that. They'll think, "My, what a <laughs> handsome suit!" Is that Bill Murray behind him? Yes, it is Bill Murray behind me. It's Czar Bill Murray. So you can just think about that. Um, so great. Well, yeah, well, then, uh, then happy to join you all, and thank you for watching remotely from wherever you may be. You're joining me here in uh, lovely Queens, New York, in my doom chamber, uh, deep, deep, deep below the earth. And I don't know where uh, where you are. Uh, oh, I'm speaking well, to, uh, to you, guy on webcam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm Mike Reed. I'm your host this evening. I'm in the wilderness of Canada. We have other people all over the dang planet here. Uh, we had uh, somebody in um, Denmark the other day uh, whose name was actually Thor, even though I thought he was just pretending to be the comic book character. That's fantastic. Well, great. I'm I'm glad to hear that we're going to get uh, Danish viewership going on. I get along very well with the Danes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to take a minute and introduce you, and then I'm going to turn myself off, and everybody will see you and only you up close and personal. Uh, Great. So uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us, Andrew, and welcome everyone to another evening in Liberty Live. I'm your host, Mike Reed, and tonight we're together with Andrew Heaton, you've already met, and we're going to be talking at least partly about his book, Laughter is Better Than Communism. Uh, Andrew is probably Liberty's most prolific comedian. He's been, let me see if I can get all these things in here. He's been a star of the web series Cap South, where he plays the in over his head chief of staff for an in over head, her head congresswoman. He also narrates a lot of the fictitious attack ads that are in that series, and that's probably my favorite part of the whole production. Those are fun. And they're about, you can get a lot of those attack ads for Cap South on about like 30 second long clips on YouTube. They're great. Now, he's also an associate producer on the Fox Business Show, The Independence. Uh, his writing shows up pretty much everywhere, Reason Magazine, The Freeman, CloacherClub.com, and he's also a hugely successful stand-up comedian live. Uh, he doesn't just do this Liberty Live uh, from his underground lair, but also uh, on uh, physical stages everywhere in the United States, Australia, Germany, Scotland, and just last year he was named New York City's greatest new comedian. So as far as I can tell, if you take pretty much anything that's hip or fun or funny in the world of liberty and you just scratch the surface, underneath there's Andrew Keaton hiding, waiting for you. Andrew's uh, uh, book... Sure that that's a, 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 I, I assume that's a compliment, being, a, be, being the hippest guy in the liberty movement. <laughs> it's, it's a compliment, although it does make you kind of like a, like a Scooby-Doo villain. Like a, I'm, I'm watching a video and it's supposed to be about the independence and it says that their producer is going to come on and read news to them. And then all of a sudden the producer is really you. Uh, so, so, you know, it's a compliment for the most part. Uh, so um, uh, Andrew's book, The uh, Laughter is Better Than Communism, is our Liberty.me loaner for the month. So it's free to all Liberty.me members uh, for the month of October. So I encourage you to get it and enjoy it while you can. It's full of uh, funny essays and explanatory cartoons. And uh, mostly it's got robots, missiles, and peace through international extramarital affairs. Uh, my favorite concepts in it are the threat of velociraptors and pollinator babies. So it's, it's <laughs> definitely worth your time. If, if you just skim the cartoons, it'll be worth your time for sure. And the, uh, so here, uh, I'm a big believer that here in Liberty, uh, we need a lot more fun, a lot more stories, a lot more laughter to get the message across. And that makes Andrew a great messenger. Andrew, uh, welcome to Liberty Live. Thanks for coming to talk with us. Well, thank you very much, Mike. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm sorry that I interrupted you. I was just so enthused that I had to, to speak briefly. Uh, but uh, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm gushing and blushing from all the kind things you said about me and my, my career as you've interpreted it. Uh, I, I'm going to have you actually come on dates with me from now on to kind of like, like uh, be, be my herald before I enter the room. You did a very good job at that. Uh, and for those of you watching, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the book that we'll be talking about primarily today is Laughter is Better Than Communism. This is my essay of political satire that I've put together over the last couple of years. And uh, in answer to your first question, laughter is, yes, indeed, better than communism, a, a running theme throughout the book. 
Uh, before we go further in it, as uh, Mike pointed out, it's free and available to you on liberty.me. Uh, please download it, please uh, read it and enjoy. Uh, I will not be earning a profit off of it, but I'm happy if you laugh. And if you did laugh and you do enjoy the book, you would be doing me a favor if you went on Amazon and you gave it five stars and said something nice about it. Or if you don't read the book but you thought I was handsome or at least vaguely amusing for a few minutes, I have a Facebook page, Andrew Heaton Comedian. If you like that, I would, I would appreciate that. So that's something you can do for me in the meantime. So uh, they've told me that I am at liberty to talk about myself at great length, which is fantastic because I love talking about myself. And then I get to talk about my book, which I also enjoy talking about. So this is just going to be one giant narcissistic wormhole for the next 20 minutes. And then I'll kick it to you so that you can ask questions about me and I can answer questions about myself and talk about myself in a more directed, focused way uh, to uh, go ahead and sate your thirst for knowledge. Uh, so um, I, uh, I have a background in both politics and in comedy. Uh, the politics predates the comedy, um, at least in terms of training and profession. Um, I was raised a fairly stalwart, very Goldwater conservative, which is perhaps a little bit heuristically different than modern libertarians, but has much, much in common with them. The idea that government ought to be as small as possible, that it's more responsive on the local level. We generally want to favor the private sector and local government over big centralized government. And uh, I took that and have never really deviated from that concept, but during the Bush years, I uh, got fairly disenfranchised with the Republican Party uh, because they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing, or at least what they espoused that they were going to do, this, this idea of limited government. Uh, it grew exponentially under Bush. and the taxes Actually, taxes didn't raise, but spending raised exponentially under Bush. So I left, and I became an Oklahoma Democrat, which is kind of like a, a, a Republican in Maine or California. It's, it's a, a subtle third-party distinction, which is probably lost on the rest of you that are joining us from Denmark. Uh, but uh, I did that and uh, wound up working for Congress for a little while uh, as a Democrat um, for a, a now extinct group of people known as the Blue Dogs, which were sort of the moderate, fiscally conservative wing of the Democratic Party. Um, that kind of being my political thing even back then, being socially liberal but fiscally conservative. Uh, I probably could have worked for Rockefeller Republicans if they weren't all dead. Uh, but as it was, the people that were fitting that bill at the time were... Ron Paul, about three other people, and a few conservative Democrats. So I did that. And I was doing stand-up comedy at night at the same time. And then I uh, left Congress to pursue a scholarship over in Edinburgh, where I got a master's degree in uh, international politics. And things kind of took a, a surprising turn for me. I, it turns out I liked economics, which I never thought I would. I thought that economics would be this incredibly boring, very math-oriented science. Uh, but I learned a lot of things that did not require math, uh, and which completely blew my mind in terms of paradigms. And I came back and uh, tried my hand at Washington again and didn't like it so much, moved up here to New York and uh, got into stand-up comedy full-time. But over the course of that, I also started doing political satire, which is what my book ultimately came out of. Um, I was back in Washington, D.C., and I was doing stand-up, and a friend invited me to a political competition. And uh, I learned very quickly that there is a abundant, abundant supply of awkward, tall, white male comedians out there, but there's a very, very tiny capacity for funny people that understand and like Milton Friedman. There aren't that many of us, particularly those of us that'll come up on stage. And so the first kind of seed was planted in my mind of, oh, I can possibly actually find a niche for myself doing this. Uh, and at the same time, I was educating myself in a lot of uh, texts that were wonderfully, wonderfully helpful. I, I read Free to Choose by Milton Friedman, which is a fantastic book. After you read my book, if you've not yet read Free to Choose, you should definitely read Free to Choose by Milton Friedman. He's a brilliant economist and a very lucid writer and was able to obliterate many of the terrible economic preconceptions that I picked up while working for Congress, while being a Democrat, and while being a Republican. A very, very good guy to read. Um, I read Theodore Dalyrimple. Um, he is a British author. He, he does write for the Manhattan Institute, which is kind of a limited government think tank here in New York. But um, he'd worked for years and years in London as a slum doctor and a prison doctor. And it's apparent when you're reading his writing that he is, one, very, very sympathetic to the plight of poor people. Um, he's not some sort of um, classist, elitist, evil man that just wants to get his tax dollars back. He clearly cared about people. 
Uh, but at the same time, he did not think that overbearing government solutions were actually helping the underclass of London. In fact, he thought that it was leading to dependency and it was creating all sorts of problems. And so I'm, I'm kind of realizing that there's a political niche, a uh, political comedy niche for myself. I'm, I'm reading Milton Friedman, which was a good call, uh, and I'm reading Theodore Dalyrimple, and, and I'm coming back to this classical liberal perspective, the sort of initial Barry Goldwater impulse I had, only a little bit more refined. Uh, and I finally read P.J. O'Rourke, who is a political satirist, a, a brilliant, brilliant writer. And I went, oh, I can combine comedy and politics in writing. That's an idea. And I proceeded to do that. Uh, when I moved up here to New York, um, I started writing for The Freeman and for Reason and for various other publications and would either make fun of whatever dumb thing the government had done that week, which was a very broad target that did not run out of any uh, anything for me to talk about um, at any point while I was doing so, or I would write on my own blog or some other publication some kind of lesson or paradigm that had utterly blown my mind in my mid to late 20s that I wish I'd known about in college. And I ended up assembling the book, Laughter is Better Than Communism, out of these essays that I wrote. There's new content in there as well. So if, if there's some sort of stalker that's been reading my blog for the last three and a half years, if you haven't read the book, there actually is new content in the book. But um, initially, it was primarily things that I'd, I'd written for other publications. And uh, these, these concepts that um, you all probably already know, I'm kind of late to the game on a lot of this stuff, uh, were fairly bedrock economic things that have been around for a while but are really not taught very well in public schools in high school uh, or in college. They might be if you take a business class. I, I was a liberal arts major, so I wouldn't know about any of this stuff. But, um, you know, the idea of comparative advantage, which is that uh, if, if Japan is better at making robots than America, but America is really, really good at making chainsaws, then maybe America should focus on making chainsaws and Japan should focus on making robots. And by doing that, we get a maximum amount of chainsaw-wielding robots that we can you know, unleash against our enemies or just for fun. Um, the inverse of that would, of course, be protectionism, where we're, we're trying to develop America's nascent robot industry and Japan's trying to develop their chainsaw industry. And the result is that we make fewer chainsaws and fewer robots. Um, that was completely mind-blowing to me, the concept of comparative advantage. And in, in real life, you know, England's not very good at making wine, but it is good at making whiskey and that kind of thing, or Scotland's good at making whiskey. Um, so that's it's one of many concepts that, that came up. Um, the idea that uh, actual growth and relative growth are a thing was a huge paradigm shift for me. And uh, to, to throw that out there, uh, relative growth is the idea that, you know, there's a fixed pie, and I'm going to get a larger percentage of that pie. Um, so, you know, rather than you having 50%, me having 50%, I'm going to have 60%, you're going to have 40%. It's this idea that there is a static amount of wealth and we're trying to get the most of it. This is typically kind of the mindset of the left, uh, the, the idea of inequality being innately bad. Um, but on the flip side, you have this idea of actual growth, that the important thing is not proportionally whether I have more or less wealth than you, it's whether we're all wealthier. And uh, this is the whole rising tide lifts all boats theory, that if the economy is booming, there's probably going to be some inequality, but it's better to have $10 on my end and $20 on your end than for me to have $8 and you to have $11 so that there's a smaller gap, but at the same time, we're both poorer off. Likewise, a mind-blowing concept for me in my late 20s. This is something that occurred to me very late in life. If you talked to me when I was in university, and I, I think based on the, the readership and the viewer demographics I've seen, a lot of you that are watching are probably in college. This was all news to me uh, that I hadn't really studied. So I, I sat down and, and started writing these articles and these, these pithy blog posts uh, about these various concepts and made it funny by putting in horribly drawn cartoons. I have no artistic ability whatsoever. Uh, I have learned how to make stick figures very emotive, and I've likewise learned that if you make them cute with big eyes but then give them guns or have them say awful things, that it tricks the brain into laughing so I can make them funny. Um, and then I, I took these lessons and then just kind of chucked jokes on top of them all over the place. Uh, and I think was able to make a fairly palatable um, series of economic and political lessons that are primarily funny and just kind of happen to have some substance behind them. Uh, if anybody here ever reads Dave Barry or P.J. work, both of those are major inspirations. So if you were to imagine Dave Barry and P.J. work getting kind of drunk 
and then drawing poor cartoons. That would probably be the, the book um, because I'm not quite as smart or talented as either of them are. Uh, but it was a great opportunity for me to explore these, these new concepts that, that I've been kind of wallowing the last few years. Another one that um, when I was working for Congress didn't even occur to me was the idea that subsidies are bad. And that's probably very elementary to everybody that's watching this right now, that, that the vast majority, if not all, subsidies are bad because we're taking tax dollars from one person and giving them another. This had not yet occurred to me when I was in my, my early 20s. Um, I hail from an agricultural state, so shouldn't I favor agricultural subsidies? No, because aside from the fact that, again, you're taking people's tax dollars, you're also distorting the market. You're going to create lots more high fructose corn syrup because it's easier and cheaper to produce. Uh, and on top of that, you're going to give lots and lots of money to uh, very wealthy, large agribusinesses, which are going to turn around and buy up the local small town farmer that I'm allegedly rooting for. Um, so I've, I've kind of had this turnaround. The, the book was a wonderful epiphany in that capacity that I was able to capture and put forth. Uh, the other bit that I was able to put in was not necessarily things that uh, had surprised me or, or altered my worldview, but just things that really profoundly irritated me. Uh, I've focused so far in my speaking to you about economic uh, fiscal conservatism and, and you know, limited government in that capacity. But on the flip side of the coin, socially, there's a tremendous amount of things that, that irk me of um, trying to govern people's social lives. Uh, as I was writing these, these articles that I would put together and, and put into a book, uh, Oklahoma had a legislator that tried to pass a law, it failed thankfully, to allow the state national guard to ask if you were gay and kick you out. Um, the logic being, I think, that lesbians cause tornadoes. And so if you were going to allow lesbians onto the national guard, that that would somehow create more tornadoes. And so we would just try and head it up. I, I confess, I don't entirely know the logic. I suspect that it's rooted in trying to make a biblical government as opposed to letting people live their own lives biblically or not biblically and having the government be kind of hands off. Uh, but that rather irked me. And I was able to put in some, some funny things and kind of stick in the screw and talk about that. On the flip side, here in New York, uh, we just finished the long reign of his paternalistic eminence, uh, Mayor uh, 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 Marcus Aurelius Julius uh, Bloomberg, who was very much a intelligent man that wants to put that intelligence on you and fix your problems for you. And I'm, I'm opposed to government paternalism. I think it's terrible. Uh, the, the soda ban, I think it was an awful and dumb idea. I'm glad that failed. And even, even the stuff that seems more apparent on its head, like smoking bans, I think is a terrible idea. Um, I don't smoke because I know it's bad for you. Uh, I think you should have the right to do it. But even if we adopt this uh, typically very liberal mindset that we're going to try and help as many people as we possibly can, and particularly the, the lowly and the poor, smoking bans are still a terrible idea. Because typically the people that are affected by smoking bans are people that are kind of uh, on the edge of smoking. You know, think, think about your friend. You all know somebody that smokes once every three months when they get drunk, and then they kind of brag about it. I, I have friends like that, but they're not regular smokers. Those are the people that are affected by smoking bans because... Next time they go buy tobacco, the prices have increased enough that they go, oh, it's not worth it to me. I'll just go get a mojito. Uh, the people that are not affected by smoking bans are the people that, I'm sorry, not bans, uh, increases in taxes and things like that. Um, the, the people that are not affected by, by rising prices in tobacco um, uh, are, are the people that are chain smokers, which tend to be disproportionately poor. And so when you raise the prices on tobacco and you try and, and penalize people using taxation, uh, to do a particular behavior you want, all you end up doing is making poor people poorer. Um, and as I'll talk about here in a minute, I'm, I'm a utilitarian by nature. I, I want to help as many people as I can. I've got a soft spot for poor people, and it's my position that uh, unwieldy government programs and centralized programs tend to hurt a lot of people and poor people, and that the best thing you can possibly do for them is to harness the capacity of the free market and competition and innovation and let that lift up everybody. Um, so... Those are kind of the things I go over in the book. I don't think I've been particularly funny. Trust me, the book's much funnier than I'm being right now. Uh, even when I'm dry, I can at least interpolate pictures of robots and, and chainsaws and all sorts of various things to, to make my point and drive it home and allow for a visual medium to happen. Now, when I assembled the book and I put it together, there were a few concepts that I, I found that I hadn't realized I was kind of working on at the time that, that became dominant, uh, dominant themes uh, in the book. 
The first one, which you, you've noted ascertained, is that it's bad um, for the government to hurt people, uh, to force them to do things that they, they don't want to do that's not hurting anybody, uh, as with our, our gay friends that are sometimes impacted by legislation from more co socially conservative states. Uh, or conversely, big businesses co-opting the government to hurt small businesses and carve out a market. Uh, or hurting consumers by being able to make a monopoly, things like that. All of these things are bad, very standard libertarian elements there. The other thing that, that came out that I realized when I was piecing it all together was this reoccurring abhorrence of tribalism. Uh, and I, I started noticing that when I was working for Congress, and I've noticed it more and more since I've left. Uh, and that, that appears a lot in the book, this idea of uh, don't... Whoop, sorry, my computer died out there for a moment. This idea of don't... Go with a group thing. You know, just think for yourself. Be capable of making friends with other people that you disagree with. I think that's very important. But just having a my team versus your team mentality is a terrible, terrible way to run a country, which is very much what we have right now. Uh, we've got blue team and red team fighting each other back and forth. And there are some neat people in Congress, and there are certainly a lot of independent minds in the parties themselves. Uh, but by and large, I think both exist to perpetuate themselves. Uh, you know, Republican strategists' goal aren't to fix the country, they're to beat the Democrats. Democrats strategists aren't trying to fix the country, they're trying to beat the Republicans. And uh, I, I don't think that benefits anybody. Um, I don't think I cover this in the book. No, I do actually, yes. I'll, I'll go again and give you a little bit more uh, of, of a background on that. There's an experiment called the Robbers Cave State Boys, uh, which is a, a wonderful window into groupthink, where um, I think back in the 50s they took a group of demographically identical youngsters, I think age 16, all uh, lower middle class, Protestant, white males, demographically standard guys with, with no, um, or I should say demographically homogenous guys, uh, and they took them to a camp for the summer, and all they did was split them into two different groups. And the second that they did that, they started to come up with different poles for distinguishing themselves from one another. Hitherto, they'd been exactly the same, uh, but now group A would say, we're going to do Bible study every morning. And group B would go, we're not going to do Bible study, that's stupid. And then group B would swear. And group A would say, we don't swear. Uh, there seems to be this intrinsic part of human nature that we like to create a division and have our group identity based on rejecting another group's identity. And then we really want to root for our group. And we really want to fight that other group. We want to root for our football team. We want to root for our basketball team. And the same, the same mentality applies on a governmental level, and it's very unhealthy and very destructive, and, and I, I've found that that's irked me quite a lot, so I wrote about that in the book a good deal. Now, uh, a, a couple of things that I'll, I'll talk about before I kick it off to uh, Q&A, things I got wrong in the book. Uh, it's only been out about a year, uh, but there were a couple of things. Uh, one is a prediction that I, I bungled. Um, as I was publishing, the Farm Bill was just about to be signed. Uh, the Farm Bill is, of course, the um, once every six years boondoggle, wherein the government takes a ton of money and gives it to large agribusiness. And at the time, I swear, there was information which indicated that we were actually going to get a good farm bill, that they were going to fix a bunch of problems. And I wrote uh, this essay kind of talking about all the terrible things that had happened with farm bills previously. For instance, we for years and years um, gave agricultural subsidies to tobacco farmers because we want to help the local family farmer, right? And then we would also have a national tobacco tax because tobacco is evil and we want to encourage people not to smoke. So we would kind of negate what was happening but drag everybody else into the process, this giant changing of money. But at the time, uh, it appeared that they were going to fix a lot of these egregious um, opportunities to take advantage of the Farm Bill and get rid of guys like myself living in New York with a plastic plant getting $30,000 a year. Uh, I turned out to be wrong in that one. The Farm Bill was not nearly so rosy as I thought it was going to be. The other bit um, that I've, I've kind of changed my tune on is that uh, when I was working for Congress, working for kind of a, a third column dark wing of a party makes you like bipartisanship and it makes you like moderates because everybody hates you. Uh, the Republicans didn't like us because we weren't Republicans. The Democrats didn't like us because we were economically literate. And so we were getting a lot of flack from both sides. And so when I started piecing this book together, I, I kind of had this impulse to like moderates and to, uh, to like bipartisanship. And I think, incidentally, in regular life and conversation, those are still wonderful virtues that you should strive to have. You should have friends that you disagree with. That's healthy. Uh, but when we get to the congressional level, um, 
I've noticed the last year since, since this book came out that when the Republicans and the Democrats agree with one another and pass bipartisan legislation, it's only ever to spend more money. You don't see them getting together to cut anything. You, you don't see them getting together to do deficit reduction or really fix any problems. Really what they're good at is agreeing to spend more money. And we're way past what we should be spending. Uh, we, we can't sustain it. So um, for, the, for the members of Congress that I had thought were rather obstinate and throwing the whole thing out of whack, I, I see where they're coming from now. And I've, I've changed my tune on that. Um, the other bit that I'll, I'll do as an addendum to that is uh, I do have a chapter talking about kind of the, the difference between utilitarians and deontologists. I know that sounds really wonky, but it's actually funny because I, again, put in lots of cartoons and pictures and things like that. Uh, I, I still think that that, that uh, scope can exist within really any political party, any political movement. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a utilitarian. and I do think that libertarians uh, outside of Congress tend to oftentimes veer towards being so purist and doctrinaire that they alienate not only other libertarians, but everybody at the party. Uh, and so uh, I would I would caution those of you reading to you know not be too um, Spanish Inquisition Murray Rothbard Atlas shrugged in, in terms of your your conversations with other people because you're going to risk alienating them and not having any type of impact on their thoughts uh, and of course you should be open minded to other people's I happen to think I'm right about everything but I have been wrong in the past so it's been beneficial to me when I've uh, opened my mind and been corrected by smarter people notably P.J. Bork and Milton Friedman. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll talk about briefly is the, the role of humor in political satire, and I, I think that's an important one. Mike brought up earlier that there's uh, not that many humorists in the libertarian movement or the freedom movement. Uh, there's certainly not a lot in the Republican Party or the conservative side of things. It tends to be very much dominated on the left. I don't think that there's anything innate to humor which would make it one type of political grouping or, or political mindset. I think that libertarianism would be rife for it because humor is by nature anti-authoritarian, and, and libertarianism is very anti-authoritarian. And so there ought to be a very large group of people that can come in. Uh, I think the Republicans and the conservatives have been kneecapped a lot of the time because they want to make fun of big government, but they can't make fun of founding fathers. That's holy. And they can't make fun of you know God or, or religion because that's literally holy. Uh, and, and humor, whenever you start creating sacred cows that you just don't touch. It dries up your creative process and it limits the amount of things you can make fun of. It also makes you a little bit less genuine because you're clearly rooting for something at that point. Um, and humor tends to do much better when you're, you're being naturally funny and letting the cards fall where they may. Uh, and uh, I think for the most part I do that in that I, I believe what I say I'm trying to be funny and I, I happen to be libertarian. Um, the other bit I, I will mention with comedy and with, with humor is that it is a very good medium for reaching people. In my experience, if I argue with somebody, and I'm a likable guy, but if I argue with somebody, their adrenaline level is going to shoot up. Mine will too if they start making good points. Uh, I'll start to, I'll kind of get back and I, I tighten my jaw and I get very patrician and very patronizing. Or if they say patronizing, I'll say patronizing just to screw with them. Uh, and uh, that increases uh, more adrenaline and makes it even more difficult to exchange ideas. Humor breaks that down rather quickly in, in a really, really nice, uh, cool way. I mean, on a chemical level, if, if I make you laugh, you get a little spurt of endorphins. When that happens, those defenses that you have are going to drop. Because for a moment, for a split second, you and I are part of the same little team here. We're on team laughing at this thing we just laughed at. We're, we're sharing an observation. We have enough data that we agree that something's funny. And we're both on the same side of things. We're, we're standing laterally with our shoulders together, right? Uh, and that's different than when you're having an argument. When you're having an argument, your adrenaline level goes up, and then you raise those defenses, and it makes it very difficult for you to understand what somebody else is saying. And I've been amazed in the last three years at how receptive people are that do not agree with me if I'm being funny. Uh, as Mike mentioned, I do stand-up comedy, and when I do stand-up comedy, I've been astonished that both liberals and Republicans that are social conservatives tend to laugh at the stuff I say because they go in knowing that it's it's meant to be funny. Um, I'm not particularly mean about it. And I dare say that when I tell these jokes, very briefly, people do kind of put on a foreign idea, if, if only for a moment. But uh, I think my role in the universe is to make people think and make people laugh. Um, persuading them is sort of secondary to why I was put on this planet. And so I'm quite happy if I can accomplish either of those goals. It would encourage you all to do so as well. 
uh, as I said, humor is a, a fantastic vehicle by which to communicate things to people and uh, a good way to make yourself question things as well. Uh, so I'll kick it back to Mike here in a moment. Um, I'm doing a couple of other projects, so keep your eyes peeled for that. I, I host a program called Econ Pop, which is sort of what I'm doing with this book only on TV. We take, uh, we take films like the Lego movie or Ghostbusters and then go through the economic concepts that are in it and explain them in really funny ways because I don't know how to talk straight other than interviews like this. And uh, then the other thing is I'm going to be doing some sketch comedy in the future. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll kick it back to Mike so we can do some questions and answers. But I'm, I'm thrilled that you all brought me on, and I very much enjoyed talking to you. And uh, again, if you read the book, um, feel free to shoot me any emails. If you want to argue with me, I'm happy to do that with you too. But if you do like it, uh, give me some stars on Amazon and, and say something nice, because that'll, that'll benefit me when this wonderful month of interacting with Liberty.me concludes. So Mike, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, kick it back to you, and we can, we can moderate some Q&As. <laughs> Coming back. Oh, there's there's oh, this the start time. sharing button that minutes, you press. Right? Yeah, that's about twenty minutes. About twenty minutes. That's wonderful. Um, that's what I was oh, for. wonderful! Uh, you, thank you, you so much. Uh, myself, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, hey, uh, so if you guys uh, aren't familiar with the interface, you'll see up in the top right of your screen there's a Q and A box, and any question you put in there, it's easy for us to see that it's a question. Uh, to relate to Andrew and he can answer it. Uh, depending on your setup, we do have the power to bring you on video to interact directly with the famous one and only Andrew Eaton. So if you want to ask your question yourself, just put the word video at the front of your question in all caps, like like this, and put it in put it in the text thing. Just put video in front of your question and I'll know I'll try to activate your camera and your microphone so you can come in and talk directly. Uh, uh, Frank Markopoulos wants to know, uh, Andrew, Frank Markopoulos wants to know, what is your favorite dim sum restaurant in Queens? Frank, um, I appreciate that you think that I am that ethnically diverse and adventurous with my palate that I would know a good dim sum restaurant. And you might even infer that I've been on dates to one. That's not the case. Uh, I have a fairly restricted palate here in New York, uh, just because I'm, I'm new to the neighborhood. I mostly eat sushi and uh, ravioli pizza, which is fantastic. So if you're ever in Queens, I'd be happy to point you to uh, the ravioli pizza restaurant that I like and the sushi restaurant that I like. But feel free to let me know where you can get good dim sum, because I'm not even sure what that is. Is that Korean? I, you know? I think dim sum is Chinese, but, uh, you know, here in Canada, we just eat moose whenever we can find it, and that's it. Uh, I had it a, a few times recently, and that is a great country. Are you from there? I'm I'm from there and uh, still residing there. <laughs> which which bit of Canada are you in, Mike? I'm I'm almost directly in the middle. I'm just outside of. <laughs> yeah, it's a country, Jeffrey. Um, it's uh, it's I'm just outside of Winnipeg, so I'm right in the middle of Canada. So if you go fly a little bit uh, east from the maple syrup and a little bit west from the gigantic mosquitoes, you come to where I live. No, it's it's a terrific country. The the. Th I visited Toronto for the first time two years ago, and Toronto is like New York if it were run by National Public Radio. It's this very, like, nice, <laughs> pleasant version of New York. People hold open doors. Uh, and the other bit that was weird is that um, your people are preemptively apologetic, which is bizarre. Like, I thought I was polite hailing from the American Midwest, but I've got nothing on a Canadian. Uh, like, I would, I would meet people and go... Good morning, and they'd go, oh, sorry, I didn't realize it was morning. And I'd be like, what? Why? I don't even understand why you're apologizing about that. It just seems odd. Uh, and then I would, like, claim that I was Stephen Harper and yell at people and say, I'm Stephen Harper, give me food, bring unto me maple syrup and virgins. And they would play it, they were like, okay, uh, you look very different, Prime Minister, because they couldn't call me out on it, because they're too polite to do that. So they just pretend I was Prime Minister for an hour. It's great. You want to take advantage of people's nice niceties, go to Canada, find country. And actually freer than we are economically now, too. Fraser, Fraser Index. Fra Fraser yeah. Institute's out of Canada, isn't it? And they do, they do a, a, a survey, or no, they do a report every few years. And uh, Canada's significantly outpacing us in terms of regulation. They're much less regulated the state than the United States is and have a much less potent federal national government than the United States does. Uh, everybody tends to reference Canada as a super liberal country because they've got a... Uh, socialized healthcare system, but it's still done a on a provincial to provincial level. And after that, it's really quite free market. 
So well done, well done. I encourage you yeah. to run for parliament, Mike, and I will uh, I will be happy to, to to do whatever I can on my end. I'll I'll spirit money to you or or something. I don't know. I'll I'll go up there and pretend to be Canadian. I'll pretend to be Stephen Harper and lend you my support. Well, good, good. You could also lend me some of Stephen Harper's maple syrup and virgins, too. <laughs> Happy to do so. <laughs> oh, I've, I've lost hey, you. Are, are you. I went silent for a moment there. <laughs> I'm hoping you can tell us a little more about the Econ Pop project. You just kind of tossed that in there at the end, but I know it's this new project going on. You've got uh, videos that uh, play with existing movies and such to to tell economic lessons. Uh, can you tell us a little more about how it works? It's yeah. It's it's uh it's both it's film oriented, which is different than the book, and it's uh, a little bit more pedantic in that the book oftentimes goes on hilarious screeds where I'm just lambasting something I don't like, whereas the uh, the the stated goal of econ pop is to be educational and funny, whereas the the goal of the book was purely to be funny, and it's uh, a coincidence that it happens to have any substance, if that. Uh, but uh, the the Econ Pop series uh, that I, I do in conjunction with Emergent Order down in Austin is designed to explain economics in fairly straightforward layman's terms that are funny. And we do it by investigating movies and going through and um, picking out the economic concepts in them. Like if you watch the Lego movie, the Lego movie is this wonderful, wonderful film in terms of uh, how terrible it is to have a massive centralized government, uh, how bad it is to have crony capitalists running everything. And, uh, and so we can really talk about that, that you know, command economy going on and make it funny too, and then have me play with Legos. My favorite bit in the entire series is that we, we actually green screened me into a, uh, a bit of Ghostbusters. So if you, if you go to econ, uh, econstories.tv, which is where that's housed, or you Google econ pop, um, you can see me apparently be a character in Ghostbusters, which was thrilling, as is evidenced by my uh, Bill Murray poster over here. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so we, we do that. And we've got um, at least three more coming up that we'll be filming in November and uh, have, have run a, a large gambit of economic concepts. Um, if you want to laugh and later sound like you know more than you do, it's a good series to watch as it'll get your feet wet in economics and do it in a, a palatable, funny, uh, known medium to you. <laughs> it does sound uh, like a lot of fun. So it's an ongoing project. It's not finished. There's a bunch more of them coming out. Yeah, we, we're backlogged. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I'm doing the, the writing for it, uh, and, and I get to be the on-air talent, uh, which is great fun. Uh, but I don't have to do any of the editing or the, the production side of things. That's left to the, uh, the very good guys at uh, Emergent Order. And so they're, you know, they're working on other projects, too. They've, they've got to uh, pay their bills and other, other means and other projects. Um, so we were releasing them about once every month, once every two months. We've got um, Treasure of the Sierra Madre coming out. Uh, we're going to do RoboCop, which is a great film. I just watched that recently for Econ Pop. If you haven't watched RoboCop, uh, read my book, then read Free to Choose by Milton Friedman, then read Parliament of Horrors by P.J. Work, then watch RoboCop because you've earned it. Uh, having read three books in a day, do it in a day. Um, go ahead and watch some RoboCop. It's a great film. Yeah, we're going to do that, and we'll do... Uh, uh, I think maybe It's a Wonderful Life for Christmas because there's some good bank run scenes there and I'm pretty sure I could do a good Jimmy Stewart impression being a very tall, awkward white man that ought to have been born in 1920. Um, so I think I can probably make that work pretty well. And we'll be able to talk about banking and all that too. <laughs> um, uh, I have a question. Uh, Matt Gilliland wants to know, uh, what's the toughest part about making politics funny? You talk, you talk as if the politics is almost secondary to your job of being funny, but you keep doing the political stuff. You keep doing the economic stuff. What's the tough part? Of, what's the toughest part about making that come together? Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, I think you said, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Um, that, that is a great question. How do you make politics funny? And what's the, what's the toughest part of it? Um, I, I mean, I do view myself when I'm being a comic as primarily being a comic, and, and I, that's not just how I personally identify it. I think it's it's. Uh, directly necessary to what I'm doing. You, you can't put the cart before the horse. And you do see attempts at this every couple of years. There'll be some conservative attempt to make sort of a conservative version of The Daily Show. And it always fails uh, because they're basically trying to make propaganda and then doing comedy as a secondary course to that. And people see through that very quickly. And I think that it also hinders your creative process. You just can't do that. And you don't need to do that is the other bit. 
Um, I mean, to, to, to pull out a couple of wonky terms, you've, you've ontology, uh, right? The, the substance of a thing, and you've got uh, your, your epistemology, how you understand the thing, the lens of the thing. Like you've got the star, and you've got the lens that you're looking at the star through. Or if you change the lens, you'd have a microscope, right? So the lens is like our, our political identity, and the thing is the thing we're talking about, or the, the ontology. We're talking about Congress or whatever. Um, my, my point is this. The, the lens is going to happen without you having to do anything at all. So I, I'm, um, I'm going to have a libertarian perspective whether or not I'm, I'm working at it or trying it. It's going to creep in. And, and I've had this pointed out to me at times when I really didn't think it was going to happen. Uh, for instance, when I came back from my master's degree, I worked for about six months as a Segway tour guide in Washington, D.C. And uh, I was given fairly implicit instructions by my employers that, you know, we were going to have people of all political stripes, and we know you're funny and you do political humor, but don't do partisan political humor or whatever uh, when you're doing these. Um, keep it keep it neutral. And I did that as best I could. And I had somebody pull me aside one time, and he goes, so you're libertarian, right? Now, I'd, I'd mentioned nothing about that. I don't think I'd said anything about Ron Paul or anything like that. I just... I've just been making fun of every single government institution that we went by, like every single one of them. Uh, and uh, and he was like, no, it's just it's quite clear that you have a vast amount of contempt for the federal government and both political parties. And so I would infer that you're libertarian. I'm like, yeah, that's that's accurate. So my point is that uh, at least at least in, in terms of putting comedy first, uh, I think you have to do it. And I think that the, the politics, particularly if you're talking about politics, will naturally fall in suit with. The mindset that you're bringing to it, you don't have to work very hard to do that. Um, the the reason that I, I keep going back and forth, I'm fascinated by politics and comedy, so it makes logical sense for me to do it. Um, I think even if even if I wasn't um, career-wise angling to do that, uh, I would probably still do it just because I, I find both comedy and politics so fascinating. But on a personal level, uh, I I definitely see a market deficiency there. Uh, to pull out some economic terminology. There's not a lot. I mean, there's plenty of people that have a great sense of humor that are libertarians, uh, that are Democrats or conservatives that are looking for uh, a different viewpoint. And um, I, I think that particularly as my generation and the generation following me comes into its own, I think it's going to have a much more libertarian-oriented bias to it, where you have a lot of people that don't trust the government, but they really like gay people, and they really like smoking pot. And so they're they're not really your traditional... Uh, middle America conservatives, but they're not really liberals either. And as they come into their own, they're going to want somebody that's funny that can talk to them. And I'm trying right now to angle myself to be that guy. Uh, so when that moment happens, I can just kind of step up and be ready to do it. This is the longest preface to your question ever, Matt, and I apologize for that. But the, the tough part of making politics funny is knowing your audience and not making them uncomfortable and being able to find potentially offensive or dour topics to make them funny, or find very boring topics to make them funny. Um, so in the first case, and this, this doesn't apply with the book because this is self-selective. Um, you know, people aren't going to buy it unless they think it's going to be funny. Um, for the record, I've, I've had a lot of Democrats buy it that thought it was quite funny, uh, and I, I avoid using partisan labels as best I can, including libertarians, because I, I want to communicate the concepts rather than the tribal identity, uh, which helps. But um, on, on an on a audience level, when I'm doing stand-up comedy, what I have found is that if I'm doing observational comedy, think like Jerry Seinfeld, and then I go into politics, it makes the room very uncomfortable. Now, it doesn't matter what I'm saying. I, I could be saying fairly neutral, benign stuff, uh, but what happens is the audience noticeably stiffens, and they are afraid that I'm going to point at them and go, who? Who did you vote for? Did you vote for Obama? Why? I, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm a very nice comic, and I don't you, you paid to see me. I'm not going to make you feel bad. I, I, don't, I don't work that way. But they do get um, alarmed by that. And what I did for a while was I would make fun of Democrats, and then I would make fun of Republicans, and then I'd make fun of Libertarians a little bit less. But, you know, I'd definitely make fun of the Republicans and the Democrats, thinking that that would sort of balance itself out, and I would be fair and even-handed. Um, that doesn't really work, because really all you've done is singled out the three different groups in the room and made fun of all of them. And they remember that more than they make fun of you making fun of people they disagree with. Um, so I, I've noticed that when I'm doing observational comedy, it's best to steer clear of politics. But conversely, um, I, I get hired to do uh, political humor sometimes. Uh, the, the Club for Growth and Americans for Prosperity and America's uh, Future Foundation and Students for Liberty uh, and a bunch of other really, really good three-letter acronym organizations have had me come out and do stand-up comedy for them. When they know that I'm going to be doing political humor, they're great because they're expecting it and they're ready for it and they're not 
afraid that I'm going to attack them, and they could probably beat me if I did. Uh, so, so that one works out fairly well. Then the other bits about making political humor difficult are when you've got a uh, a sad situation or a dire situation, and there I think it's more an ability to know when it's appropriate to joke about things. Um, so uh, I've, I've found, like I, I talk to other comedians, and a lot of the comedians go on television shows, uh, and they'll sometimes ask my advice if I'm familiar with the television show. Uh, and I generally say, like, you don't have to be funny when you're talking about ISIS. Uh, if we're talking about, you know, somebody getting beheaded, it's probably not going to be a very good joke. Um, even if it is a really good joke, it's probably going to be in such a glum, serious uh, context that nobody's going to laugh very hard. Um, so it's really best to just deal with it straight uh, and, and not, not try and be funny at that particular time. You can be funny five minutes later, but don't be funny then. Um, so things like, yeah, beheadings, uh, you, you can, any terrible tragedy that just happened is probably not something you should make a joke about, at least immediately. You should, you know, wait a few hours or something. Uh, and then the other bit that's tough is um, finding things that are really wonky and making them funny. Um, now, it's much easier to do that in a book, uh, like with Laughter is Better Than Communism, than it is on stage or on screen, because uh, when you're on screen, it's an extremely visual medium which tends to limit itself to sound bites. And uh, so you can explore things a lot easier in written form. Uh, but even then, I, I think that the trick is being able to make it relatable rather than dry. Uh, cartoons help a lot because they, they break up the monotony of things. Uh, and and I, I use that in the book all the time. Um, examples, I think, are good because you can take um, you can take the same kind of thing that you're talking about. Like if we're talking about comparative advantage, I can bring up Japan making robots and America making chainsaws and use this sort of ab absurd thing that still fits the pattern of what we're discussing. And, and that allows me to crank in the joke uh, and keep it going. And then to add a little bit more to that, there's there's sort of a um, kind of easy tricks that humorists can employ uh, that you can put in virtually anywhere. So let's say we're talking about something that isn't very funny, that is not rife with content, uh, like, like the Fed. Um, if you're talking about the Fed or, or anything else that's, that's you know, kind of a, a boring subject to most people, uh, if you ever have a list of three things, that's a, a really good opportunity to put in a joke because you're, from a humor perspective, you've put in one data point, you've got a data point. You put in two data points, you've got a pattern, and then you put in the third thing and you can derail that pattern to make it funny. I know that sounds dry, but if I say one, two, diving board, purple, blue, Tyrannosaurus Rex, there's a little puff of humor that's in there, and, and you can put that in. Um, but beyond that, you can I, I think like you know there's there's ways to uh, make dry hum dry content funny just by really really getting into the the mechanics of, of humor. You can uh, there's there's ludicrous humor. Am I am I just babbling at this point, Mike? Should I you know, should I keep going with the straight of that? No, keep going. Okay. Um, when you get into no, humor, keep going. there's really kind of two dominant strains that you can vaguely subdivide things into. And this isn't a clear cut thing, but it just for organizational purposes, it's helpful. There's uh, the ludicrous and there's the ridiculous. Uh, the ludicrous is crazy, right? It's it's looking at a situation and making it nuts. So think like Monty Python or think um, uh, Jack Handy or or or, some, or or when you're watching a television show and like a central character is crazy or it's a sane person surrounded by crazy people. That's ludicrous humor. Um, and the flip side of that is ridiculous humor. And the root of that is you're ridiculing something. You're you're finding something. And you're really going down and just trying to knock it down. And that tends to lend itself a lot to political satire because it's easier to do that. It's easier for me to have a target and then um, point by point make fun of it and kind of knock it down a peg. It tends to be a little more vitriolic too. Um, but you can you can go the other way, like because with with um, with dry things, even if you can't really sink your teeth into it and, and ridicule it, uh, you can inject this sort of weird. I might be a little bit crazy in my interpretation of this, and uh, and that ends up weirdly making it satirized. So you you could like say take the Fed and agree with it and go this is a brilliant idea. We should have a central bank that gives money to its best friends. And uh, oh, I know, rather than having taxes, we'll just have inflation. Huh? That'll take it. And you can like basically agree with it and agree with it to such an insane degree that it's very clear you don't like it and you can kind of be funny and put in 
humor through that gap of what would be normal reality versus what is the uh, the insane level that you've brought it to. Anyway, great question. Thank you very much for giving me a spouting point. Uh, yeah, and and wonderful answer. Plus, uh, free joke skills on the yes, the yeah, one no. uh, one two diving board deck. Yeah, it's a, an easy an easy end. So there you go. Everybody, go write articles for the various publications you'll be competing with me on. <laughs> yeah, your magic is over. There's going to be about fifty new liberty comedians with exactly That's your stick any minute it's now. Like, it's like Barnes and Noble selling a nook. They're under they're undercutting themselves. It's not a good idea. That's just what I've been doing. Um, I, I was thinking about this Segway tours that you used to give in the capital. That sounds like a great fodder for a, a series of like one minute YouTube videos, you know, and you roll up on the Segway in front of the Fed, you give you the Fed and then roll on and well, the next setting idea. is. I like that. Like having Andrew Heaton's Segway tour of Washington, DC, uh, and just going up and basically <laughs> saying what I think of everything. That'd be great. Um, no, it was, it was, yeah, that was, it was a fun job. Um, I was a fun tour guide because I'm a stand-up comedian and I, I know history pretty well and I used to work for Congress. So it was a neat nexus point. Um, and I, I also got like the most angry I have ever been as a libertarian was through Segway licensing. Uh, and I realized that there's all sorts of terrible things that are far more unjust that I should be way more worked up about. I get that, but I'm a petty person and I'm a tiny person. And at one point, I was I was doing these Segway tours, and I got a shakedown from the cops, um, who, to their credit, they were very nice personally, but they, they pulled me over on a Segway with, when I had people with me, and they went, do you have a license for this? And I was like, I did not know that I needed a license to be a Segway tour driver. No, I don't. And they, again, kindly went, well, uh, according to D.C. law, uh, you have to have a tour guide license to do this professionally. If we see you do it, we're going to let you go back. But if you do it again, we're, we're going to have to put you in jail and fine you uh, for the grievous sin of giving a tour guide, a tour uh, to people without a license. And I figured like, well, maybe this is like, you know, vaguely common sense. Like maybe, maybe they want to make sure that I know like traffic patterns and basic CPR and, you know, safety issues. I can kind of understand maybe why they'd want to regulate that. No, none of that. It was this ridiculous bullshit test where you had to go in and answer questions nobody like like questions like which president stayed of the octagon house uh, I'm gonna take D no one will ever ask me that question because nobody cares and uh, and some of the questions were just they, they literally didn't make sense one of the questions and I'm paraphrasing I don't know the exact numbers and I think it'd be illegal for me to say it but whatever uh, was how much land in, in Washington DC does the federal government own 15, 32, 46, 82. And I looked at it and I went, this doesn't have a percentage or acreage or anything. Like, you've not clarified what you're talking about because you know it's a bullshit test. You're doing it as a racket and a cabal to drive people like me out of business and to make money off the licensing scheme. So anyway, I, I passed the thing and I was angry as hell and like, could just, like the ghost of Barry Goldwater was like hovering over me the whole time saying like, break the desk, steal all the pencils and I wasted the building. Uh, I, I ended up leaving and came to New York. And here about a month ago, DC sent me a cease and desist letter saying that I, I was forbidden by law to continue doing Segway tours. And I wanted to write in the bag and be like, do you guys know that I've been gone for a year? Like, I haven't, I haven't even been in the swamp uh, for like four months at this point, let alone for doing tours. And yeah, anyway, yeah. The, my point is, yes, the Segway tour thing is rife for uh, political commentary and political humor. Andrew, I just want to ask uh, one more question before we go. Uh, BK Marcus uh, wants to get your opinion on a PJ O'Rourke thing. So um, BK says that PJ O'Rourke says that uh, comedians are naturally reactionary because they hate change. And is that a place where you think PJ O'Rourke has got it wrong? Or is there a kernel of truth here? Naturally reactionary because they hate change. That's interesting, and, and very interesting from, from PJ, who would, who would describe himself as a conservative, to somehow pump uh, Edmund Burke into humor. Uh, that would definitely be his forte, uh, and uh, I, could, I could see him saying that. Um, I, I think that comedians might be naturally reactionary, but I suspect that it has more to do with what type of comedian you are. Um, if you're a topical humor comedian or a political satirist, you're probably generally going to be more reactionary. Like if, I, if I'm doing political satire, it's much easier for me to just look at the newspaper and go, okay, 
um, I'm going to uh, write about this dumb thing that Joe Biden said or that John Boehner said or whatever. Uh, that's, that's a fairly easy thing for me to do, and that's what PJ's been doing for the last 30 years, and he's very, very good at it. Uh, but conversely, for you know, for humorists uh, of other persuasions, like I've, I've written a, a, a novel called Frank Got Abducted, which is a funny science fiction novel. Um, that wasn't in reaction to anything. It took a long time to write that thing and, and put the thought into it. Um, so I don't know if, if humorists uh, or comedians are naturally reactionary. Um, I do think that uh, uh, comedians have a high amount of defense mechanisms bundled into it. You do see that a lot, particularly with stand-up comedians. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to create distance uh, by, by performing for you so you don't really see what they're like on the inside. Um, and, uh, and, and you do have some commonalities there, but I don't know if I describe us as reactionary. But then again, if, uh, if I've, I've met PJ twice now, and I, I don't really want to bicker with a guy. He's, he's, I've, I've literally got a framed picture of him in my office that's signed. And uh, when uh, the first time I met him, I gave him a bottle of whiskey because I, I have such great respect for PJ at work. So that's my opinion. I, I think I disagree with him, but you should probably agree with him because he's, he's better. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, uh, speaking about distance uh, for... Uh, having this closeness with us. I mean, I know geographically we're separated, but there's been this wonderful, just spontaneity, fun, openness in the conversation. And so it's, it's been wonderful to be able to abolish that geographical distance between us and have a, a real a close conversation. Uh, before we go, everybody, I want to let you know about a, a few things that are coming up and then I'll give Andrew um, the last word here. Um, so uh, we got next week, I want to tell you about a few upcoming classes that are coming and uh, but first uh, before I tell you about any of that stuff I want to tell you uh, how to get to more Andrew Keaton stuff so here is the central headquarters of all things Heaton and this is the mightyheaton.com this is Andrew's website it comes with a great picture of him fleeing from what appears to be a gigantic uh, ant robot uh, so it's that's that's his main website here's the website for the Cap South video series this is the series where Andrew plays one of the two main characters, and also Andrew narrates a lot of the attack ads. And again, I think the attack ads are solid comedy gold. That's Cap's out. Uh, then there's Frank Got Abducted, which he just mentioned. This is his new novel. I haven't checked this out yet. It uh, obviously has a fun premise. And uh, here we are. If you go and see it, you'll see it begins with an alien abduction on the front page, or on the, on the title page. Here... And then, of course, i got to let you know about Laughter is Better Than Communism. This is the one that's our loner book this month from Andrew. And I was going to leave it at that, but Andrew brought up something earlier today. Oh, it's Econ Pop, the new project that Andrew's working on. If you like more of this video medium rather than the readings, or, re or and rather than checking out the Cap South stuff, or in addition to it, you might check out what he's doing. Yeah, if you're more lazy, go check out the Econ Pop stuff, and there'll be more and more of that coming out over time. Okay, uh, so thank you so much, Andrew, for being with us. I'm going to tell everybody just a little bit about three upcoming events. Um, I've got two events for tomorrow. Uh, number one, at 2.30 in the afternoon, Eastern Time, the one and only Jeffrey Tucker is doing his third lecture on the man of the century, Ludwig von Mises, in his works. Here's a link on that one right here. So that's the Jeffrey Tuck Tucker lecture we've got going on tomorrow afternoon. And then at 9 tomorrow in the evening, we have the return, sorry, 9.30 tomorrow, we have the return of Zach Slayback on love, hate, and the state. And it's all about uh, the psychology of uh, liberty or the psychology of emotions and morality and how that relates to liberty. And I think uh, Andrew's talked a lot about using humor as a way to break through uh, emotional barriers that prevent people from thinking carefully politically and economically. And so I think there's a real synergy there with uh, what Andrew said and what Zach's saying. And then finally, I want to let you know that I'm coming back next week. We've got another author's forum. And this is with Tracy Lawson. Earlier in today's talk, if you followed the obscure references, the Fraser Institute, uh, which we mentioned earlier, is doing an economic freedom index, uh, placing Canada higher than the United States. One of the guys who works at the, at the uh, Fraser Institute is named Bob Lawson. We had him on last night. Next week, we don't have Bob Lawson. We have his wife, Tracy Lawson. And she's actually doing a really neat fiction thing with her novel, Counteract. And I want to show you... Uh, that Amazon link. Oh, I already gave you the Amazon link for that. 
And that's her uh, dystopic uh, novel set in the year 2034. And it's in a setting with total state control of people's movement, what people can eat, what people can say. So it's probably a lot less upbeat than reading Andrew Heaton. But if you've read a lot of Andrew Heaton humor and you're feeling you're writing a little too high, you want to level things out, go and check out this dystopic novel and then come back and meet with me for our Authors Forum next Wednesday. Okay, uh, that's all my announcements. Once again, thank you everyone for a wonderful evening and thank you, Andrew, for joining us. Andrew, I'm going to give you the last word. I'm going to uh, sign out here. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you everybody for watching and listening. I appreciate it. Stay funny, stay free. That's it. Good night, everyone.